I want to share with you an idea that some of you may be familiar with, and that is that many of you have, may have grown up with the concept that if a child in a family leaves the faith and becomes a Meshumad or marries out of the faith, there was a custom to sit shiva for that, for that child. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, have you ever heard of that custom of sitting shiva for a child who becomes a Meshumad? who leaves the faith or converts to Christianity or, uh, or marries a non-Jew. This is, there was a, 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 there was a Yiddish uh, play and a Yiddish film called Tevya that was produced in 1939. And in the, in the movie, in the film, Tevya and his wife sit Shiva uh, for, uh, for an hour when their daughter goes off and marries a Gentile Russian revolutionary activist. Of course, it's based upon the story of Shalom Aleichem, and eventually they made a, a fun musical called Fiddler on the Roof. But originally, it was a very sad story, as you can imagine, right? But of course, everything turns into a celebration, and everything's okay, we accept everything. But of course, in the original film, Tevi and his wife sit Shiva for their daughter for going off and marrying a, a non-Jew. But in reality, nowhere in Shulchan Aruch is this custom to be found. Nowhere in Shulchan Aruch is the custom to be found of sitting Shiva for a child who becomes a Meshuma. It's simply not brought down in the laws of mourning. And if anything, there's quite a contrary law, which is that if a person passes away, and that person was a Meshuma, that person was living their life as a, as a Gentile or as a Christian or some, or some other faith, then you don't sit shiva for that person. In other words, what's brought down, it's codified in the law, is not to sit shiva for someone who did not live their life as a Jew. Mm -hmm. But nowhere does it say that you should sit shiva for a living person who leaves the faith. There is, however, and again, we don't, uh, we don't have all the time to go into this, but if you take a look in, um, in, in Sefer Hasidim, uh, which is a very early work from, from Germany, from Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid, from the 12th century. He writes in source number three, HaMeimer es hadas umes, that if a person leaves the faith and then dies, Ein bochin alav ve'ein maspidin alav. We do not cry for that person, we do not eulogize that person. And quoting a pasuk from Sefer Yirmiya, which says, Al tivkul do not cry for the deceased, referring here to a person who has left the faith. <coughs> but rather instead cry because that person has left the faith. In other words, don't cry when they're dead, but rather cry for the person who has left the faith while they're still alive. <laughs> because they have left the law of God. <laughs> And why should you cry for a person who leaves the faith when they're still alive? Shema Yashuv, thinking that maybe they'll do tshuva. She says, no, kilo yashuv od, because that too will not transpire if we're not, if we're not careful, because that person may never end up coming back to the faith. And therefore, from Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid, the way that he interprets this Pasuk in Yirmiya is, there's no use in crying for someone who lived a life outside of the faith of Judaism once they're dead, because there's no hope left. There's nothing to mourn anymore. But what you can do is you can cry for someone who's alive and has left the faith, because maybe there's always hope that, they'll, that, they, will, that they will come back. And the imshav vameis, bochen alav. If, however, the person did tshuva before they died, and then they died, then you can cry for them. And therefore, when a person actually leaves the faith and he slams the door on his family and on his faith and he goes and he becomes a Meshumad, so then you should cry. And the reason is, is because when the body is lost, if that's enough of a reason to cry, so surely when the body is, and soul is lost because this person walks his, uh, you know, turns his back on Judaism, then surely it's re a reason to cry. 
דבר אחר כי לא יושב עוד נאמר על המחתים לפי שלא יושב עוד שהם מספיקים ביד אולי לעשות שוב and therefore one of the ways that you could read the last part of that פסק in Yermi when it says כי לא יושב עוד that this person will not do תשובה is referring to a person who causes other people to sin and what the Navi is pronouncing about such people is that that person will not be given an opportunity to repent because his crimes are so great in that he's caused others to sin Hashem will therefore not give that person an opportunity to do tshuva. However, what you see from Rabbi Yehuda al-Chassid is that we do not mourn for a person who left the faith once they die, but there is this aspect of crying and mourning for a person once, while they're still alive, once they've left the faith. We have this on good account, that in the Hagahu Tashri, which was also written in the medieval period, it's a commentary to the Rabbeinu Usher's commentary, it's a super commentary, to Rabbeinu Usher, which is a commentary on the Talmud in source number five. And he writes as follows, Neherag bidei nochri mitoch risho, havile kapara umis ablim alav. He writes in source number five in your sheet, that if a person was executed by a Gentile government while he was living as a Gentile, in other words, a guy becomes, he converts to Catholicism, and uh, the church execu puts him, executes him, right? So he says, you can mourn for that person because we assume that his execution was a kapara for his leaving the faith. And then he writes that Rabbeinu Gershon, which really the commentary says a reference to Rabbeinu Gershon, who was the Ma'or Hagola, he lived in the 10th century, and he was the great leader of the Jewish community that came to Europe. He says, Nis Abel al Beno Kishahemir Daso. He mourned for his son when his son left the faith. So that's in itself very startling when you first read it, is that Rabbeinu Gershom, who was the Gadol Hador of the 10th century, had a son who became a Meshumot, a son who converted to Christianity. And he, he left the faith, and Rabbeinu Gershom mourned for him once his son left Judaism. And how long did he mourn for him? Yud Dalad Yom. He mourned for him for 14 days. And some commentaries understand that the 14 days was to mourn for the loss of his body and his soul. Twice the amount, like we saw from Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid, twice the amount that you would mourn for someone whose body just left the world but her soul is intact. His son, because his was totally lost, both his soul and his body, he mourned for him for 14 days. Now the reason why I mention this is because the very same Pasuk that Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid quoted in, uh, to describe the appropriateness of crying or mourning for someone who leaves the faith is brought in the Medrash in this week's Parsha in reference to Esav. It's in source number four. And it says, Vayozed Yaakov Nazid, that Yaakov prepared a potted food of lentils, um, and we all know the story, yes? So the Medrash says as follows, Omer lo mativo shel Nazid zen. Esav asks Yaakov, and he says to him, what's the purpose of this, uh, of this lentil soup? Amr lo shemes oso zakein. He says, because our grandfather, Avraham, has passed away, and this is the sudas havra'a, this is the mourner's meal. The mourner is supposed to eat round food, like we talked about in the past. So Amar, so Esav says, ba'oso zakein paga midas hadin. So you mean to tell me that our great sage of a grandfather, the pious, the tzaddik, that even he too has been met with a fate of death and that God's attribute of justice has afflicted our great, pious, righteous grandfather as well. So Amr Lohei, so Yaakov said, yes, that's the way of the whole world. No matter how much of a tzaddik you are, eventually you have to die. So Amar in Cain, lo matan schar velo Esav said, if that's the case, then there is, I don't believe any more in reward and punishment. I don't believe any more in Tchiyas HaMesim, in the resurrection. I, I reject everything. Now, why Esav rejected this? Just because he had heard that Avram had died. Avram was an old, old man. He was, he was almost 200 years old when he died. So, I mean, this is not like a, he didn't die in the prime of his life. But something affected Esav by hearing that Avram had died before having accomplished whatever Esav thought that he needed to accomplish. And therefore, he denied God and his entire system of justice. The Ruach HaKodesh Tzovechas, and it's at that moment that a heavenly, uh, the, the divine voice cries out and says, Al tivku lemeis ba'al tanidulo, do not cry for the dead and do not shake your head in mourning. 
Ze Avraham. This refers to Avraham because basically there's no need to cry for Avraham because he's gone to a far better place. But Bacho Tivka Laholech, but cry for the one who leaves, meaning the person who walks away, Ze Esav. This refers to Esav. Meaning that, okay, so fine, you don't want to mourn for Avraham because Avraham was such a tzaddik, he died at his right time and he's going to a better place. But at least you have to cry for Esav because it, look at what happens to Esav. He turns his back on Yiddishkeit. Now, it seems to me that if you understand the Midrash properly, the purpose of crying, or for those people who had the minhag, like Rabbeinu Gershom did, to sit in mourning, the purpose of this was not to basically say, okay, life is over, just this person is dead to me. You see very clearly from Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid that was not the objective of the crying in the morning. The objective of the crying in the morning is that for the dead there is no more hope. But there's always hope for this person. So if, maybe if I cry hard enough, this person will one day come back. That's the purpose of crying in the sitting of Shiva. It's not just to say that this person is dead, but rather to say, and like Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid had pointed out, he said, because he says, because Kilo Yashuvod, because will he not re return? Maybe one day he will return. Maybe one day we'll be able to get him back. And if we cry hard enough and we pour out our kishkas to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, maybe that child of ours will be able to come back to the fold. You know, I, um, I, I, this is on my mind a lot because I meet with a lot of families uh, in our shul. A lot of the families in our shul have children who have left, or grandchildren who have left the fold in, to one degree or another. And there's many times there's a conflict that people have, what kind of interaction, especially if my son or daughter has married out of the faith, what kind of interaction am I supposed to have with that child who has left the faith and is intermarried and is now starting his own family now? What kind of interaction am I supposed to have with those children? What kind of interaction am I supposed to have? And I once heard a shir many years ago from Rav David Cohen Shlita, the, 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 the Mardasra of Gavul Yaivitz in Brooklyn. And he had said that he had a Kabbalah from his rebellion. He said that when it comes to a daughter who leaves the faith or who marries out of the faith, you always leave the door open because at least her children will be Jewish. When a son leaves the faith or marries out of the faith, then all bets are off. Then you have to, you can't go and say, I'm going to ask a Shaila, or I'm going to go follow and do what Rabbeinu Gershom did, or I'm going to close the door. You have to treat it on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to know who the child is, what the relationship that he has with his girlfriend or his wife, what the prospects are for the future, what the nature of the personality is, what... And so you have to, okay, so close the door, but don't lock it or leave it open a crack. And make sure that there's always the opportunity for the son to, to be able to, to, to come back. Asaf had the opportunity to become a Balchuva. We're going to read in a couple of weeks that Yaakov Avinu was criticized. You know why he was criticized? Because he had the opportunity to keep the door open for his brother Asaf, and he slammed the door shut. Where do we know this from? In Parshas Vayishlach that we're going to read in a few weeks, it says that Vedina Eichan Haita. It says that when Yaakov was traveling, it says he took his, wife, his wives and his 11 sons. So the Medrash asks Rashi, quotes the Medrash, where was Dina? So Rashi answers, he locked her up in a box because he didn't want Esav to place his eyes on her but that was an Avera, that was a sin on Yaakov's part. Because if he had perhaps been more open to trying to endear and bring Esav closer, and maybe even think, contemplate enticing Esav by introducing him to his beautiful daughter Dina, maybe life and maybe things and maybe all of Jewish history would have been different. But because Yaakov Avinu locked the door on Esav permanently, there has been this constant struggle since that day between the people of Yaakov and the people of Esau in a constant battle 
and look at all the blood that has been spilled as a result of the fact that Yaakov did not leave the door open a crack. We have to remember that uh, the customs of, of past generations don't always translate well to the, to the world of today. It was okay for a, a, our grandparents' generation to sit shiva for a mishumad who left the faith and for Tevya to sit shiva for his daughter. But we don't have that luxury today anymore. We have to make sure that our children have an entree back so that we will be reunited with them and that we'll be able to see future generations from them. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.